Today begins a four-week series of messages. And if you've come to our church on a regular basis, you know that I never do a four-week series of messages. I do a 34-week series of messages, typically. Um, But this four-week series of messages culminates on November the 12th when we as a church family will make a commitment to impact 2020, this big step of the future moving uh, toward the building. It's a commitment to pray. It's a commitment to serve. It's a commitment to sacrifice in our giving to the cause of Christ through that ministry. And so we're going to be asking you, and you're going to be hearing more about that. But But I wanted to lay the foundation in these four weeks for why. It's one thing to say we're going to build a building, and just so you know, there's still a lot of T's to cross and a lot of I's to dot. We'll keep you aware of what's happening in that regard, Um, but there are just a lot of moving parts that still have to come into place on the construction side, on the design side, on the financial side, on the leadership side. All of this, is it's like a moving target, but we believe God is moving us in that direction, and we're continuing to move forward, and excited about it, really excited about it, but it's a big step, the biggest step we've ever taken. Um, I think it's important that if we don't know why we're taking a step like this, it won't really matter, and so what we're going to do over these four weeks is each week we're going to look at one of the versions of Jesus' final words before he ascended. These have come to be known as the Great Commission. That terminology is not used in the Bible, but we know it as the Great Commission. Now, almost always we think of Matthew 28 when we say the Great Commission. But the other Gospels have Jesus' final words, and the book of Acts has a brief understanding of that. So we're going to look at those. We're going to look at what the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and the book of Acts have to say. Today, we are looking at that Matthew 28 passage. So if you have your Bibles, please find Matthew chapter 28. I've told you the story before, Uh, many of you know this story, but when my father-in-law was, we believed, about to die, he was about to have a very critical surgery, his cancer was pretty advanced, and the surgeon and other doctors had made it clear to us that he might not make it out of this surgery. And so with that in mind, he gathered us around his bed in the hospital, and he went around to each one of us one at a time and shared words of encouragement and challenge, that was his way. He would always give you the good and the challenge at the same time. And uh, I remember because when it got to me, I had a lot of questions. So I started asking questions, and finally he said, Eddie, stop. I have other people I have to talk to. So he stopped me. But, you know, every word that was coming out of his mouth in that probably 30-minute interaction that we as an immediate family had with him, I was, I was hanging on every word. I mean, my father-in-law was and is to this day though he is in heaven now, one of my heroes in the faith. He was a pastor, a leader, a godly man. Um, He raised the woman that I love. So there were just a lot of things about him that I really admired. And so I listened to every word that he had to say. Jesus gives these words just before he's going to ascend to heaven. It's after the resurrection, but it's just before the ascension. And he, he gives these words and They're powerful. They're his last words on earth. I think we should consider what he chose to say as significant to who we are today as Christ followers. So all of you in the room who who claim the name of Christ and know him as Lord and Savior, this is significant. And and so over these four weeks, we're going to look at that with with the bigger picture of understanding that the reason we have trunk or treat is because of Matthew 28. And and the building that we're talking about building, this large, multiple millions of dollars facility that will be used in so many wonderful ways for both school and church, it's just trunk or treat on steroids. That's really all it is. It's yet another kind of tool. It costs more. It's more complicated and time-consuming and the stakes and the risk are a lot higher. You know, if trunk or treat flops, eh, we got a little candy left over. The building's a bigger step, and we all know that. We recognize that. But we don't need to live according to the fear of what that might mean. We, we really believe that God's calling us to take this step, to take it with great knowledge, with great information, with great wisdom from multiple different kinds of gifted people, which we're doing, 
In fact, we just enlarged our building team with three more people who are new to our church since we started this undertaking, and all of them have extreme construction experience and knowledge in the field. Thank you, Lord, for sending us more. We have finance people who are coming to us. I mean, it's just, it's great how God is working all of this out. But at the end of the day, it's not so that we can have a bigger building. It's not even really so that we can have more people coming to church. Although that should be a byproduct of this. It is so that hell gets smaller and heaven gets bigger. That's why we're doing it. And if we miss that, we've missed everything. So please keep that focus as you consider how you will give, as you consider how you will pray, as you consider how you will serve, as you consider how you will view this undertaking called Impact 2020. So I've entitled the series of messages, Impact 2020, Commissioned to Care. The word commission is a great word. Um, it's, it's used here. It's this passage, Matthew 28, verses 16 to the end, is, is considered the great commission, the commission that our Lord gives to the disciples and early followers. Um, our missionary services through our denomination as those missionaries are getting ready to go out to the different fields that they are called to, they call that a commissioning service. Those who serve in our military are commissioned to their post and to their rank and to their future. It is a commissioning. They're called commissioned officers. So, so there is this direction that God is giving us. Let's hear what he has to say. The introduction begins in verse 16, Matthew 28. Now, the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him. But some doubted. I just want to say, before I read the rest of this passage, it is so refreshing to read God's word and see the utter honesty of how it comes. You know, you wouldn't think, in human terms, that God would have included a less than positive statement in this, but some doubted. But isn't that the way it always is? Don't we sometimes doubt? Don't we sometimes fear? Don't we sometimes wonder, could this happen? I do. When we were um, building this building, and a handful of you will remember this, I got ulcers. Why? I was afraid. I really believe. I, there was, nothing changed about my diet. I didn't start eating spicy food all of a sudden. No, I, I was afraid. And it had a physiological effect on me. I think that God is calling us to be faithful and to trust him in the different areas of our lives. And all of us have those situations where if we allow ourselves to figure it all out, could be related to job, to family, to finances, to health concerns, whatever. Whatever the situation, if we allow ourselves to do all of the work and all the figuring, fear, frustration, doubt, ulcers, whatever, panic attacks, they, they will come and, and we become immobilized. Well, good news, God has given us very clear marching orders, and we can trust him in that. And we can take those steps and know that, that he's, he's got us covered. So some doubted. And Jesus came and he said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Now, that's good news. It's, it's as if he was saying, look, I really am the one in charge. So what I'm about to say comes with weight behind it. I have all authority. The Father has given me all this authority. Heaven has said, speak it, make it so. And then he said these words, which we know, all of us Christians know these words. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Now, some things that we know, any of us who have been Christians for any period of time have probably heard a message on this passage. I will not give you a new understanding of it today. This will probably not be the best message you've heard on this passage, but that's okay. The passage speaks for itself. 
some things to consider. And if you're new to this passage or, or haven't considered it before, consider these things. He's been given all authority. The word go, in the original language, which would have been Greek, is not literally go. It's literally as you are going. It's a participle. It's not, it's not an imperative verb. There's only one imperative verb in this passage, and it's make. The word make. Make disciples is imperative. The others, go, baptize, teach, those are participles. Those are add-ons. Those are sort of assumptions that you'll be doing these things. Okay, It's critical that we understand that because I believe what this passage has to say is that there is one purpose of the Christ follower and one purpose of the church because the church is made up of Christ followers. We are the church. You are the church. Those of you who know Christ as Lord and Savior. And that one purpose is to make disciples. Now, how do we make them? Well, there are two answers to that question, which can be a little confusing. He says make disciples, but at the end of the day, ultimately, only Christ can make disciples. How's that? Well, what, what he's chosen to do, because he has all authority, remember? He's chosen to use us in the process of people coming to know the truth about Christ. Primarily, I believe, as a mouthpiece. Occasionally, you will hear of people who got a copy of God's Word, started reading God's Word with absolutely no other human intervention. They read, they believed, they came to know Jesus. But it's rare. Don't you hear in most stories, you know, my friend Sam was talking to me. He'd been talking to me about Jesus for a while. We had coffee together. He challenged me on some things. It made me want to go out and read the book of John because that's what he challenged me to do. I read the book of John, and I came to know the Lord. Now, now who did the saving? God did the saving. But John was instrumental. John was used of God to set an atmosphere and an environment so that that guy would come to know Jesus as Lord. So he begins, number one, going. Because that's really what it is, as you are going. going. So going is assumed. We're going, right? Do you go to work? Do you go to school? Do you go to the gym? Do you go to the restaurant? Do you go on trips? Do you go on vacation? Do you go to dinner? Do you, we're going. If you're not going, you're dead. We're going. You're going to church this morning. We're going. So the assumption is that we're going. That, that's nothing new. We don't have to work at going. We're going. But we do need to be intentional about how we go. And that's what Jesus is talking about here, I, I truly believe. All Christians are in some sense missionaries. Michael and Celia said that, that part of why they, a big part of why they came to our church is because they felt like God was encouraging them to find a church that emphasized and was involved in missions. They come the first Sunday and our missions pastor is preaching about what? Missions, because that's what he does here, Pastor Daryl. I thought, Michael, you came because of me, so I'm trying to, <laughs> trying to get over that, but I'll, I'll work through it. So that was confirming for them. Oftentimes, though, so they already had a missionary heart. They, they wanted that. They, they looked for that. So they were already there. But oftentimes, you feel like, because of your doubt, because of your fear, because of your anxiety, because of your busyness, oh, I'm not, I'm not a missionary. So when our church talks about missions, and we talk about Haiti, and we talk about Guatemala, and we talk about France, and we used to talk a lot about Peru when we had a commitment there, and we've had other commitments through the years, China, Ukraine. Cuba, all of these are places where we have done missions work. You can get in your mind, well, that's for other people who get on an airplane and do missions. And I would say that that's a very short-sighted view because missions begins here. Let me ask you a question by show of hands. How many of you who are Christ followers in the room, and you count yourself as a Christian, how many of you would say you know at least one person who probably, though you're not their judge, but more than likely, they are not a Christ follower? Raise your hand. Look at that. You just announced your primary 
mission field. And I'm pretty sure you don't have to get on an airplane to share with them the hope of Christ. It begins there. If, if you cannot share with the people who are close to you, and, and by the way, the closest lost people oftentimes live in your house. I tell parents all the time, our greatest mission field and our first mission field is parents, our children. That we might set an atmosphere for them to come to know Jesus as Lord and Savior. And we can't make that happen. Why? Because we don't save people. Jesus does. By his grace. But, but we create an atmosphere in our home that helps to model that. No guarantees, but that's a mission field that we have. Those are conversations that we have with our children on a regular basis. And so, so God is calling us to that. We are going. The church is the solution. The church is plan A, and there is no plan B. In Ephesians, the apostle Paul writes that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known. Not, not in any other way. We're it. There's no other plan. That's why we do trunk or treat. So, so if trunk or treat yielded one conversation, I'm thinking of Norm. Norm was in the last service. Not this Norm, a different Norm. Norm was in the last service. Norm has that 1968 or 69 442. Have you seen it? It's parked out here. He makes the coffee every week. Norm brings his car every year. He opens up his trunk. He puts in a single poster, a white poster that says, Jesus loves you. That's his whole decoration because his car is the decoration. It's really a cool car. Everybody's oohing and aahing at the car. Jesus loves you. And in the trunk are, are a couple of baskets of candy. And Norm just stands there and says, hey, how you doing? Hey, how's it going? Nice, nice to meet you. How you doing? How's it going? Hey, nice. He meets people. And we interact. And there are 50 of those cars. Some of them are way more elaborate than a poster that says Jesus loves you. But the idea is the same. What if in the interaction of trunk or treat, there was one relationship that yielded over the course of a few months maybe, or maybe a few days, but at some point in the future, it yielded that person bowing a knee in their heart and receiving Jesus as Lord and Savior by the power of God's grace. Trunk or treat was just worth, and then some, a ton of candy and 50 cars and us coming out and us enduring some wackiness. It's Halloween night. It's a little weird. I'm just saying. It's a little different. I always meet some interesting people at Trunk or Treat. And I'm sure they say the same thing about me. But, you know, there's that interaction. Hey, if, if I thought that would happen every single time, we do Trunk or Treat every night of the week. It's worth it. The Word of God says that when one sinner repents, when one sinner comes to know the truth about Jesus, all the angels of heaven rejoice. <laughs> Let's do that on a regular basis. And, and remember, this next building, like I said, kind of tongue-in-cheek, but there's some truth to it, trunk or treat on steroids. It, it's going to allow us the tools to do some things that we aren't currently doing. It's going to allow us the opportunity to, to, to have some gatherings. What if in that now MOPS ministry, which is already going strong, but I think it'll get stronger when we have more space and more creative opportunity with this new building. MOPS, just one example of one of our ministries, mothers of preschoolers. Do we want to teach best practices for parenting preschoolers? Sure. Do we want to, to help moms build fellowship and relationship with each other so that they don't pull their hair out all the time with their preschoolers? Sure. But let me just say, those are secondary primary, you mop that come and you bring your lost friend or your lost neighbor or the mom that is the room mom with you in school or preschool and you, you're there and, and, and she comes to know Jesus as Lord and Savior, Whew. let's do mops more often. So you get the picture. This is why we're here. As we are going, think intentionally. Now some churches have redefined what the church is supposed to be. I'm, I'm submitting to you that I believe this is the primary purpose of the church, to make disciples. Why? Because that's what Jesus chose to say right before he left. 
Some churches have decided that feeding food to hungry people is their primary purpose. That clothing people who are poor and destitute is their primary purpose. That building housing and, and foster care and on and on the list goes. Now, please don't misunderstand me. Am I saying that any of that is wrong? No. In fact, Scripture encourages and commands us to be a part of those things as well. But there can only be one main thing. You can't have 17 main things. And while all of those things are really good to do, none of those things yield eternal fruit. They yield temporary fruit. But they can be bridges to the eternal fruit. They build a bridge to now have that conversation and share Christ. To now point to the cross, and Jesus said, and I, if I be lifted up, and he was referring to the cross, I will draw all men to myself. We point to Jesus, crucified, risen, coming again. He is the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father except through him. Here's this food that we want to give to you because we're Christian and we love you, and we believe Jesus has commanded us to feed those who are hungry, but we have some food that will make you never be hungry again. John chapter 4, the woman at the well, Jesus said, you've come to draw water. I tell you, I will give you a kind of water that will cause you never to thirst again. She said, bring it. I want that kind of water. That's what God's called us to do. That's what God's commanded us to do. If we're doing anything less than that, we're doing less. We're not doing what we've been commanded to do. We're missing the good sweetness of what God has called us to as a church. So, going. Secondly, baptizing. Baptizing. Baptism is a symbolic act of worship. And it symbolizes Three things, I believe, and I'm going to give you those three things. But I, but I want to encourage you that the reason that we show our baptisms, you know, if you've been a part of our church, we know that people can't always go to a beach baptism. Even when we baptize people here on the porch or in the past when we baptize people in swimming pools, you can't all be there. It's impossible. We show the video on a Sunday and then we post it online because we want everyone in the church to see it because it's a reminder for those of us who are Christian it's a reminder of who we are in Christ. I, uh, I oversee a lot of weddings, and I'm, I'm sure as our, as our church gets older, I'll be doing more and more weddings, but um, I love to go to weddings. I love to go to weddings. I, I, I kind of like going to weddings when I'm not the one in charge, because I pay attention more. You know, when I'm in charge, I'm worried about what I'm going to say next. When I'm not in charge, I get to just enjoy, you know, what's being said and what's being done. And I love it. Every time it's the same, especially if it's a young couple. You know, they're, they're in their 20s, they're, they're scared, they're nervous, they're kind of crying and laughing and stuttering all at the same time, and they're facing each other, and they're repeating their vows, and, and you can tell, and sometimes you see the guy's hand shaking, you know, because he's thinking, what am I signing up for, right? And they exchange the rings, and they answer the questions, and then there's the I do, and the kiss, and it's done. When I go to those kind of weddings, I sit with my wife. I put my arm around her. And I remember 29 years ago, I was the one saying I do forevermore, for better, for worse, till death do us part. Sometimes Laura will cut her eyes at me at that point and say, remember? I do. I do. And I still do. It's so important because it reminds me of the commitment I made. Well, baptism is kind of that same thing. I remember what Christ did in my life. I was only nine years old. I don't remember a ton of things from when I was nine years old, but I remember my baptism for several reasons. But one of the reasons is because I went to a very large church. We had the big baptistry over the choir loft with the glass face. And, and it was a Sunday night, and I, I came down into the water, and, and it was a big baptistry. It was deep. So I had to stand on a concrete block because I was only nine. I'm standing on the concrete block with this big white robe on. The pastor had a big white robe on. And, and he baptized me. I was the last one that night. There had been several before me. You've heard me share, but the one right in front of me was a quadriplegic that they strapped to a straight-back wooden chair. Four deacons and the pastor came into the water to baptize him. I'll never forget that. So I'm making my way out the stairs, and I hear the pastor walk up to the glass, as he always did, and for all of my first 18 years of life, I had the same pastor. And he said these words as he always did. It has been done as our Lord so commanded it to be, and yet there is room. It was a reminder for all of us 
that the task of discipleship is not over. We have been left here that we might make a difference, an impact, if you will, in the lives of people. Baptizing gives a symbolic picture of three things. One is repentance. Repentance gets a bad rap in our culture. That word, people make fun of that word in the culture. It's because oftentimes the only time they've heard that word is, is when it's in a, a comedy or, or some legalistic kind of genre where it comes across like repenta and not the true biblical picture of repentance. Repentance is a great word because it recognizes the fact if the cross, if you'll allow me to let the cross represent the presence of Christ in our lives, we are by nature moving away. It's what we do. We're uncomfortable being in the presence of Christ. Why? Because he's perfect. We're not. And so we, we drift. Even those of us who know him, we drift. And with repentance, initially and then continually, we turn. And we, we turn away. But, but oftentimes, again, because of the bad rap of repentance, it comes across as only a turning away. It's everything I won't do. I won't sin anymore. I won't use foul language. I won't drink too much. I won't smoke. I won't, uh, you, whatever. You fill in the blank with whatever legalistic list you may have. I won't cheat on my taxes. I won't lie to my spouse. I won't, whatever. You fill it in. But here's the struggle with that view of repentance. It's, it's legalistic, which is an unbiblical thing. There's always another rule that you need to follow to feel good. You can never get there by rules. Just read the entire Old Testament and figure that out. It's not just a turning away from our sinfulness. It's a turning toward Christ. And when we turn toward Christ, we recognize how deficient we are, but we, we recognize how sufficient He is. That He has everything that we need. It's, it's like that picture of Isaiah chapter 6 where Isaiah saw the Lord high and lifted up. And when he did, he immediately hit his knees. He said, I am unclean. I live among unclean people. We are sinful. Ah! It's my loose translation of what Isaiah said. And then at the end of that experience, it's as if Isaiah, kneeling before the Lord, said, Lord, I will do what Ever you want me to do. Here am I, send me. I'll do it. I will do your bidding. I will follow your plan. So repentance brought him to that. Another thing that baptism shows us is forgiveness. It's not the thing that forgives us. Christ forgives us. He cast our sin as far as the east is from the west to remember it against us no more. It's that the baptism, this immersion where I am going into the water symbolically a sinner and symbolically I'm coming up out of the water saved. Now, it's already happened prior to that. But it, it shows the symbolism of the heavy cost of the cross and the transforming view of forgiveness. 1 John 1, 9 says, But if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. The third thing is inclusion, inclusion. Baptism is identification with Christ, very much the same. We share this in our membership class. It's very much like a wedding ring. Now, if I take my wedding ring off, I'm still very much married to Laura. In fact, with me, you could tell because I never take it off, and I got this indentation in my finger. I guess my fingers used to be smaller. Not sure, but anyway. I'm still very much married whether I wear the ring or not. I'm saved whether I'm baptized by immersion or not. But baptism is that outward symbolic, we believe, confession of Christ before men. If you confess me before men, I will confess you before my Father who is in heaven. So we believe it's a part of that confession process of publicly acknowledging, yes, by the grace of God, I have been saved. I have been changed. I have been, as John 3 says, born again, spiritually speaking. I'm a new creation. The old me is gone. The new me is here. So it's identification with Christ. But secondly, it's an identification with the church. It, has, it is historic in the very early days of the church and continuing now for 2,000 plus years. It has been that identification marker that ties you to a local family of believers, the family of faith. 
It's a ceremony of first steps in the faith. Remembering what has been done on the cross for you and celebrating what will be in the future done in your life. So, that's the picture that baptism gives. Repentance, forgiveness, inclusion. Next, he talks about teaching. And in teaching, he talks first about how we need to be obedient. I believe the understanding of teaching is first and foremost obedience. Knowing is not enough. Knowing is not enough. Doing is the proof in the pudding. There is a verse in the book of James that wreaks havoc in my life on a regular basis. I've shared this verse with many, many people through the years. And I have shared this verse with myself more times than I can count through the years. And here's the very simple verse of James chapter 4, verse 17. For the man who knows the right thing to do and doesn't do it, to him it is sin. Oh, I so wish that verse wasn't in the Bible. Why can't I just say, I didn't mean to. I, I, I didn't mean to move in that. I mean, I, do you know better? Oh, I, I know better, but every parent in the room, you've had that conversation with your child before, haven't you? You've had that conversation to say, did we teach you to do this? You know the answer. They know the answer. Sometimes out of spite, they'll go, yeah, you taught me to do this. But you know that's not right. You go, they go, no, you, you didn't teach me to do this. Why did you do it? I don't know why I did it. Are you going to do it again? What do you want me to say? It's like when parents say, do you want me to spank you? Do you want me to ground you? Do you want me to? I hear parents saying that to people when I'm walking through a department store sometimes. You know, they get frustrated. Do you want me to ground you for that? I just keep waiting for a child to go, yeah, you know, I really like being grounded. Would you please? I just love it when you do that. I love to hang out in my room and not have any interaction with humans. Take my phone too, would you? And, and, and remove every accessibility I have to the world. Of course we don't want that. To the man who knows the right thing to do and doesn't do it to him, it is sin. God's calling us to obedience, not just to knowledge, but to fruitfulness in our lives. We can't do it in our own strength. It's impossible. But only by the grace of God, by the filling of the Spirit of God. That's why Paul says, be filled with the Holy Spirit. That's what we're called to do. That's how we're called to live. We do not have the strength possible to do it. He calls us also to maturity. Maturity. Maturity is the natural result of long obedience to God's Word. If you're obedient long enough to God's Word, one day you wake up and you're mature. You're not finished. You're still growing, but you're not what you used to be. And, and the markers of that, some of the key markers, I believe, to maturity are humility and teachability. If ever you're around someone and you're talking about some of the very basic understandings of the Christian faith, and they go, yeah, yeah, I know that. Of course, everybody knows that. I'm not sure they're mature. Pride and selfishness and self-reliance, these are all the enemies, the enemies of maturity. If it's about you, if it's about what you can do, beware. Maturity leans heavily on Jesus and, and points only to him. And then last, I didn't know how to say this without being awkward, so I just said it awkwardly. Not just immediate decisions. Not just immediate decisions. When I was in youth ministry, I learned pretty early on that I could manipulate things to make kids pray a prayer. And I could report those numbers to my supervisor, to my pastor, whoever, and say, yeah, we, we went to camp this week, and camp was always the right place to do it. Why? Because after about day three, when they're completely sleep deprived, and you come into a worship service at night, and they're all sleep deprived, and and I just preach too long, and they start, they start saying, hey, they start crying. Wow. I recognize those voices. I just don't know where they're coming from. Interesting. I'm going to talk louder than they are. They start getting this to this point where they'll just 
pray whatever, they'll say whatever, they'll do whatever, they'll all cry doing it. They'll, oh, Jesus has changed my life. And you feel really good about that. And you come back and you report that there were all these decisions that you've canceled. Now, I'm not saying they're all false. I'm saying some of them are false. I'm going to say that. Why? Because they're probably emotionally driven. And here's how you know. In about two months, you're talking to that kid, and there is no transformational difference. The old is not passed away. God's calling us not to decisions, not to see how many people we can get baptized or how many people can pray a prayer. He's calling us to make disciples. People who love Jesus, who love His Word, who who seek to live according to its principles. Not a single one of them, us, are perfect. But there's a movement in that direction to be who God is calling us to be. And, and what that means is the Lord desires genuine transformation. He desires true disciples. And he desires followers of Christ with integrity. What does this make up? This makes up the church. But it's not just any church. It's what we call the regenerate church. The church that is alive. They are regenerated by God's truth and God's spirit. And God's presence and God's sacrifice on the cross. A church that is not that is a gathering of people. It was a long time before Park Ridge became a church. We called ourselves a church from day one. But we didn't become a church for several months would be my guess. We were a crowd of strangers who showed up every Sunday. And I would teach this book and we would sing songs about Jesus. And then over time we became the church. Well, today we are the church. And God is calling us as a church to make a difference in our world. It starts with you. Will you be obedient to make disciples, recognizing that ultimately it's by God's grace, not by anything that we do? Let's pray. Lord, I I do pray that you would... um, Remind us, those of us who are in Christ, who love you, and who would agree with what this word that I read today says, um, encourage us. Encourage us to stay the course of, of continuing to interact with people, to talk with people about the love of Christ, to talk with people about the cross of Christ, and the grace of God, and the forgiveness and the change that only God can bring. I pray for those, Lord, our brothers and sisters in Christ who are here today, but because of fear or anxiety or doubt, they hesitate. Um, They would maybe even go so far as to say, that's not really my gift, that's not my heart. I'm glad when people come to know Jesus, but I I don't know what role I play in that. And I'm not sure I even want to because I'm, I'm scared about that. Pray, God, that you would change their view, help them to see that, that you have equipped each of us to share the hope of Christ that is within us to a world that so desperately needs to hear it. And then, Lord, I I pray for anyone here today who does not yet know you as Lord and Savior. I, I pray, as always, that you would open their eyes, that they would see and believe that you are the way, the truth, and the life. Thank you for doing it in Jesus' name. Amen. As we sing together, we invite you to come to pray if you have prayer concerns for yourself or others. I'll be standing here to answer questions you may have about what it means to be in a relationship with Christ and begin that journey. Would you stand now and you come as God leads. You stood before creation Eternity to motion my soul now to stand you stood before my failure carried the cross for my shame my sin weighed upon your shoulders my soul
So what can I say? What can I do? next Sunday uh, evening. There's information about that. We'd love for you to, to be here and be a part of the prayer gathering we're going to be having for Impact 2020. Also, we want to challenge you to pray every single day as we move through these four weeks about this big step of faith that we're taking as a church. Uh, we're providing these blue wristbands. We hope you'll take one. They're, they're available on the way out the doors today. Just as a reminder, I'm wearing mine already, just as a reminder to pray. As you look down at your wrist throughout the day and, um, you know, if, if you'd rather put it on your steering wheel, gear shift, if you'd rather 
hang it somewhere prominent in your office or on your fridge or whatever. That's fine. Just use this as a way to remember to be in prayer for what uh, we're asking God to do as a part of this entire experience. You know, the, the passage that I read today finishes with, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. In another place, Jesus says, I will never leave you or forsake you. That is good news. We can trust that God has us. Last week as we finished up Thessalonians, I, I shared in that passage about the faithfulness of God. And, and it said that he is faithful and he will do it. I believe that. I believe that for you. I believe that for this church ministry. I believe that for the purposes of God in our world. Go and live in accordance with the plans that God has for you. God bless you.